Have you ever struggled to see the big picture in a medical device development project? Or have you wondered what documentation is required for a medical device product development project? Here's your chance to sort it out. In this video, I will walk you through how everything fits together and what documentation is typically required. Hi, I'm Peter Sibelius, the founder of MedicalDeviceHQ.com, and you're watching a video that's part of my online course on design control for medical devices. You can find the link for the course in the video description down below. Please do subscribe and receive notifications so you'll always be the first to see new content. A short disclaimer, bear in mind that what I'm talking about in this video is an overview, a simplified version of the real process, and your situation may be different. Now let's get started. The goal is to give you a clear view of how things fit together. The perspective that we will have is to look at the typical document deliverables that you will have in a medical device product development project to understand the flow of information and the logic behind the process. I will be showing you this by going over this web of document deliverables. So let's get started. Please note that even though other areas are mentioned in this walkthrough, we'll be focusing on the things relating to design and product development. Other areas are covered in greater detail in our other courses on risk management, medical device software development, and safety for electrical medical devices and project management courses. We're going to begin by taking a look at the starting point and then the end point of the whole process of developing a new medical device. So where does the development start? It usually starts with some kind of product ID or business opportunity that your organization would want to exploit. Moving over to the end uh, and the goal, it would be to release the product to market. This can be done with or without clinical investigations, depending on the type of product you are working with and what data is already available. Now, in this case, I've let the signing of the Declaration of Conformity and the completion of the DHF be the endpoints before getting to the market. For this overview, and because it's somewhat out of scope for this course, I've excluded regulatory submissions and clinical investigations that may be necessary just before placing the product on the market. Now let's go back to the beginning. One of the first things to do when developing a new medical device would be to understand the intended use. This would answer questions like who will be using the product, on whom, for what, when and where. This is obviously closely connected to the product ID and business opportunity that was mentioned before. And an intended use represents a reasonable starting point, not only for medical devices, but for any product development project. Some exploration or ideation might have been done in a pre-study, and it's likely that you have some idea of what the design is going to be like as well. This may very well be documented in or referenced in a project charter or project brief. And if you're really lucky, you have some intellectual property that will protect your future product from competition. Now, there are numerous different starting points for the development of a medical device, and these represent some common ones. Now, when you have defined intended use, you should be able to start discovering what the future users of your new product will need. The user needs must be documented, and a common place to do that is in a requirement traceability matrix. And when you know what the user needs are, then you can translate the user needs to technical requirements that will make sure the product satisfies the user needs. Also, the technical requirements or design inputs should be documented. This can also be done in the requirement traceability matrix. Here, I'm showing the requirement traceability matrix as two steps, where user needs would be the first, and then design inputs will be defined. In reality, this is a highly iterative process. Now, in the meantime, you might be busy working on the regulatory strategy. In fact, you might have done it already before, but you should start working with it no later than at this stage. As you can see here, the intended use is an important input to the regulatory strategy. What you claim in your intended use could make a world of difference in terms of what market access routes are open to you. And based on the regulatory strategy, you should find and define what norms and standards will apply to your product. This is where many startups will fail because they are either not aware or are reluctant to start working with regulatory questions for various reasons. But it is super critical. In a large company, this has most likely been done for you by someone in the QA or RA departments. And most likely the name of that document would be something like this example, 
for example, applicable standard and norms list or standard search report. And since the standards will contain requirements that will have an impact on your product, the applicable requirements from the standards should be found in your requirement traceability matrix that we looked at before. Now, based on those design inputs that at this point in time should be fairly abstract, you can start designing your system. This is still not the detailed design, but rather the high-level architecture of your product. For a product that is not complex, this architecture will be super simple. But if it is, as in this case, an instrument with software, electronics, and maybe a disposable sensor, the architecture becomes really important. Now, what else is going on? While you are defining your design and development inputs or user needs and design inputs, design control requirements start applying to the work you do, which means that the project manager should be busy planning the project and creating a design and development plan or DDP or project plan. And as there is software in this example product, someone would be starting to draft a software development plan as well. But planning must take place in other areas as well. For example, risk management planning. Now, before we looked at the intended use, which is usually described at a fairly high level. At this time, you could start defining the use specification, which would be much more granular and contain details about your users and patients. Why? Well, it's an important input to your usability engineering process. As you can see here, it will feed information into both the preliminary hazard analysis as well as the task analysis. Now, before we get to the detailed design, let's pay attention to the verification and validation by looking at the requirement traceability matrix again. I have chosen to depict the requirement traceability matrix once more in this overview to show that it is strongly recommended to start defining how to verify and validate your requirements already when you define them. Now, putting a short text in your requirement traceability matrix on how you are going to go about the verification is critical in helping you to understand if your requirements are verifiable. When that has been done, and if it hasn't been done already, you should also be planning the verification and validation of your product on a high level. In fact, it's a requirement to plan verification and validation according to ISO 13485. And while you're at it, also the design transfer should be planned, which is not surprising since it should be an integral part of your project. Now, there are just one or two more things to mention before we get going on the detailed design of the product. When you know roughly what the system design is going to be like and you have started your risk management work, you can perform the software safety classification. If the software comes out with a higher classification than you wanted it to, you might have to go back and iterate both on system design and software architecture. Now, if you want to learn more about software safety classification or any other area relating to software in this overview, check out the online medical device software development course on medicaldevicehq.com. The next step would be to start breaking down system requirements from your requirement traceability matrix into subsystem requirements. And the one area where this is actually required would be for the software. And now, at last, it's time for the detailed design. Here you can see typical outputs of the detailed design. What you would do to create these outputs would be to work on the mechanical design, including packaging and the disposable kit that is part of our example product. You would be designing electronics, schematics, and create Gerber files. You would be creating assembly drawings and also the labeling. And this includes both labels on the product and packaging, as well as the instructions for use. And as you can see, even though I have split it out in this overview, the source code for the software is also an output from the design effort. You can and have to continue working on risk management, documenting both the risks as well as the risk controls you identify in the hazard traceability matrix. The software will eventually be more and more complete, and you may very well be creating the software incrementally through multiple sprints. But don't forget, you still need to have documentation for what you develop, particularly when and if you have software in software safety classification B and C. In parallel with designing the product, you can create more detailed verification protocols to prove that what you have designed meets the design inputs. In this example, I have pointed out a number of likely areas to create verification protocols for. Keep in mind, you're likely to have a lot more protocols than what you're seeing here in this example, probably closer to 100 than to 5 as shown here. 
One area which deserves a course on its own is the electrical safety testing. It's actually more than that because it is everything relating to the very thick 60601-1 standard which applies to our example medical device. This testing can be both expensive and very time consuming if not done right. Now if you need to learn more about this area, do take a look at the online course on safety for electrical medical devices on medicaldevicehq.com. Now do you want a copy of the overview that you have been watching so far? Go to medicaldevicehq.com and subscribe to our newsletter and you will receive it for free. Do you know someone who would benefit from getting the bigger picture of a medical device project? Why not doing that person a favor by sharing this YouTube video to your LinkedIn network? I think people will like it. And speaking of LinkedIn, do follow Medical Device HQ on LinkedIn. There is a link to our company page in the description below. The rest of this overview is covered in the online course on medicaldevicehq.com. But remember, the PDF you can download covers the whole project. Click that red subscribe video button as well as the notification bell so you'll never miss new content. And if you want to learn more, go to medicaldevicehq.com and register for my course today. The link is in the video description. I'm Peter Sibelius, thanks for watching, see you in the next video, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs>